Hey, good morning, everybody. How are we today? Hey, let's, let's get on our feet together. We're, we're going to sing our call to worship this morning, this first song called Spirit of the Living God. We just want to pray that over our church body, what's going on downstairs, upstairs. Let's pray that over our, our church this morning. Here we go. Yeah. 
living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice, we're hanging on every word, Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more, we're hanging on every was that a way to open up the service just with a song right hope everybody had a good fourth of july hope you had a good fourth of july weekend i um i spent my last evening last night got to go downtown to see a beach boys concert um if you if you know me if you've you've been here for a while you know I, i tend to enjoy the beach boys so i always comment on it um after i go um Man, it was a great night. And I'm just thinking, we, we, just, we, we kick off the service with a song just talking about the Spirit, right? The, that song was better than any, any set of words I could have said to, like, usher in our, our service this morning. And then last night, we just get to, me and a couple of friends were just, like, filled up all evening with just some really good, like, good quality, but, like, happy, fun, loving music that just really, for me, takes me back. First, first cassette I ever had was a... Beach Boys tape back when I was four or five. <laughs> Made in USA back in the, back in the 80s. Um, and it just hits me that, like, that there's power in music. You know, there's power in, the, in song. And, and, and when we, we get the luxury here of getting to put song to the Word of God. And we're going to do a new song here. And I, I wanted to call it out versus just going into it because it's got some words that I think are really really compelling in that regard. And, and as we get into it, I, I, want, you to, I want you to think about, um, I was going to get really nerdy and talk about like a, a Brian Wilson, Mike Love thing, but we don't have time for that. Um, as, we, as we get into this song, I, I want you to really key in on the fact that it's, it's, it's called Made for More. And it's saying, like I, like, like I with God, I, I am made for so much more than me without God. <laughs> I know it's not normal to cry eight minutes into a service, but, um, but I want us to listen to that as we, as we, as we do this song and, and um, continue in our service this morning that we, I, you, are made for more because of what God is doing in your life. So let's, let's sing this. I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the start Now I am chosen Free and forgiven And it's worth the living Cause I wasn't made to be tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way. I know I am yours, and I was made for more. And I know who I am, because I know who you are. The cross of salvation. I wasn't made to 
feel that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is free And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Let my Jesus change your life Amen. Let's, let's pray right now. God, we just come to you this morning. There's so much that we have to be thankful for. You go look back on a week like this, God, and, and the, the, the things that you provide back to the beginning in today's reality around us and then looking forward. God, I'm glad that you made us. I'm glad that you made us in your image. I'm glad you made us to worship you. And I'm glad you loved us so much that, that we get to celebrate songs about the far, far future, eternity-type future. So God, I just, I just pray that, 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 let, that Ted's words be blessed this morning, that we could be, we could be attentive, um, ready to receive what you've got going on so that we can just learn more about you and, and, and dial in, dial in our worship and praise. Amen. Uh, stay standing. We've got our scripture. Good morning, Eagle Church. And uh, we are the Adesoyas, originally from Lagos, Nigeria. My name is Kunle. This is my wife, Ola, and our daughter, Jua. We also have a son, Jared. He's uh, downstairs at the preschool kids. And we are delighted today to read you the scripture from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 28 to 34, talking about the greatest commandment as provided by Jesus. And Ola is going to read in, in our native language, which is called the Yoruba language uh, from southwest Nigeria. So I read. O kaninu awon akowe to wa nigbati o si gbo bi won tin bi ara won lere oro ti o si wo ye pe o da won lohun rere o bi pe ewo li ekini ninu gbogbo ofin Jesu si da da lohun wi pe ekini ninu gbogbo ofin ni gbo Israeli Oluwa Lauren wa okan Oluwa kani ki iwo si fi gbogbo aya re ati gbogbo okan re ati gbogbo iye re ati gbogbo agbara re fe Oluwa Lauren re eyi li ofin ekini ekeji si da bi re fe omo ni keji re bi ara re ki o si fi ofin ki o si fi ofin mi ki ko si si ofin miran ti o to bi ju won yi lo Ako we not see we fun pe o lu koni o dara o ti to le o so pe olorun kan ni be ko si si omiran bi ko se ohun ati ki a fi gbogbo aya ati gbogbo oye ati gbogbo okan ati gbogbo agbara fe ati ki a fe omo ni keji eni bi ara eni oju gbogbo ebo sisun ati ebo lo nigbati Jesu ru pe o fi oye da lohun pe O fi oye da, daun, o wi fun pe, i wako jina si i joba lorun. Le ye yini, ko si si, eni kan, ti o je bi ilere, o mu, come on. This is the word of God. Yeah, stay blessed. Thank you guys. You know, way back in Genesis, man got a little too full of himself, and began to build a tower that they said could reach heaven. And God said, you know, I've got a way to fix this. And they confounded the language and split everyone up and gave different languages. And I love to hear people pray and read scripture in their native tongue. I don't understand it. God does. And what a big God we have that created every language, speaks every language, and is honored uh, through every language. And so thank you, uh, Kunle and Ola, 
uh, for reading our text this morning. July 7th. Somebody needs to pump the brakes. This year's going fast. This summer's going fast. I don't know about you, but it just seems to be flying by. If you are new to Eagle in the last few months, uh, you may be wondering, who is the pastor of this church? Because it seems like there's a different person up here every Sunday. And it's true, but Pastor Eric... Uh, is uh, on sabbatical. Uh, He is scheduled to return the 1st of August, somewhere that first week. Uh, He'll be back in the office. And so we've been blessed to have Kim Shepson, uh, our women's ministry, Brad Janiszewski from student ministry, uh, Audrey, middle school director, uh, Kurt Sovine from our district office, Kurt and Kimberly are, are members here. Kimberly, of course, just joining our staff with Eagle Kids and Eagle Preschool. And then in a couple weeks, John, our worship uh, director, John Solomon, is going to lead us through uh, a communion service. So the whole service, worship, everything's just going to be flow right right into communion. But for the next five weeks, you're going to get a heavy dose of me. I don't know if that's good or not, Uh, but I am Pastor Ted, the associate pastor here at Eagle, and I get the privilege of wrapping up the book of Mark that we have been walking through during uh, Eric's sabbatical. And so we started way back in April with Mark's gospel asking the question, who is Jesus? And Mark takes the first eight chapters of his gospel, of his writing, and he begins to answer that through uh, a very, showing a very public ministry of Jesus as he is revealing himself to the general public. And we see a lot of of power, we see a lot of miracles, of of dealing with demons, of healings, and and just God's power showing through him. And then in chapter 9, he takes a little turn, and we begin answering the question, what is the kingdom of heaven? Jesus moved to much more private ministry with just his, his followers, the 12 and maybe a few others uh, that were, were committed to following him around. And, and he begins outlining many and explaining many differences in what it means to live in the kingdom of heaven and what it means to live in the kingdom of man. And now we are walking into the last chapters and walking the last days of Jesus as we're in chapter 12 and we're going to be looking at 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 over the course of these next five weeks. And today is actually, I titled this, the sermon, The Last Question. And over these next few weeks, we're going to look next week at the last days, and then we'll have the last supper, and then we have the last breath, and then we have his last command. And so we are in the last of Mark. Now the Pharisees and other religious leaders throughout his public ministry would bring Jesus questions trying to stump him. They didn't really want the answer. They were hoping that Jesus would say something that they could use against him, something that they could trip him up on, catch him in a lie, or or catch him going against Hebrew tradition or the law. Now, I have a saying that I use probably quite often. It's not mine. I don't even remember where I heard it first. Maybe you have heard it. Don't ask questions you don't really want to know the answer to. A pastor friend of mine who I, on occasion, I had the opportunity to hear him preach, and he came to me one time and he said, do you think I'm a good preacher? (laughs) Don't ask questions you don't really want to know the answer to. I told him the truth. No, I didn't think you were great. Good, not great. Our friendship took a hit because I told the truth. Now, we resolved it over years. We're good friends again. It's no big deal. But don't ask questions you don't really want to know the answer to. And the Pharisees would have been good to have followed that advice. Because every time they tried to put Jesus in his place... He flipped it around and put them in theirs. Most of the time, the person asking the question is looking for validation of their own belief or their own action, some sort of approval to what they are doing. Don't you think that's all right? 
Don't you think that's good? Don't you, don't you think? I, you, you can tell by the tone of their voice, they don't truly believe it. They're just hoping you do. You just tell them what they want to hear. And so here we have in Mark chapter 12, a teacher of the law comes with a question about the commandments. Now he's probably pretty similar to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler just wanted validation that he was already doing everything that was awesome and great for the kingdom. Coming with a question, and most of the time the leaders came as a group and were trying to trap Jesus. So here one comes and we see that it's just one. Maybe the others were there, I don't know. But he seemingly comes by himself. Maybe he meant to trap him, but it doesn't seem to be a sense of, there, or there seems to be a sense of sincerity in his conversation, in this give and take, in this question. Maybe not so much to trap. But I'm intrigued by the last verse of, of Mark of this section, Mark chapter 12 and verse 34, when it says, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him another question. Because Jesus told the truth, whether it was hard, whether it was going to be easy for them to take, he told the truth. And from that point on, no one dared ask him anything else. That tells me that they weren't getting the answers they were looking for. They weren't able to trap him. They weren't really interested in the truth. The truth was just interfering with their life. Have you ever been there? You got something you want to do? And you're like, I don't know if this is... And and you look through Scripture, and God reveals that, yeah, this probably isn't a good idea to do it. And you're like, but I want to do it. And the truth just interferes with what you want to do in your life, with how you want to live, with what you want to believe. So what about you this morning? Do you want to hear the truth? I've got one. I'll preach for one. If I've just got one that wants to hear the truth, we're good to go. So let me ask you this question again. Do you want to hear the truth? All right. All right. Here we go. What is the greatest commandment? This is not earth shattering. This is not, it's not going to deep down and like, oh, I've never heard that before. This is probably, if you've been walking with Jesus, if you've been in his word, you've probably heard most of this. The greatest commandment, and and this is the, you know, we're we're talking about the ten that were given to Moses, and then the teachers of the law, of which this would be one of them, added over 600 more. That some numbers, I think I heard 613 commandments that the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, Sadducees, had written on how to live a good Jewish Hebrew life. And so it's a legit question. Of the 613 commandments we have in the Sanhedrin rule book, Jesus, which is the greatest? What what is the first, is another way of saying that. What's the first one? What's the foremost? What's the foundation that all of the others come from? And Jesus quotes two scriptures from the law. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now this is what's called the Shema. They they recited this regularly. This guy would have already known that. Most of the people that would have been in in, in hearing of Jesus would have known that. And then he quotes Leviticus chapter 19. He says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And Jesus is saying in these two commandments, love God, love people. Everything else is foundational, built upon those two. Love God, love people. Jesus is saying that law and love are intricately connected. Law without love is legalism. If I list a whole bunch of rules and you got to follow them and I don't care about you one iota, it's legalism. 
You do these things. Doesn't matter what you think, what you feel, what you do these things. We're going to check you on these things. But love without the law is chaos. Because eventually everyone's going to begin to do whatever they see right in their own lives. And if you love me, you will approve of what I do because this is who I am. Love without law, law without love, disaster. And Jesus saying the whole law, the whole foundation of how we live, what we are to believe, how we interact with people comes down to two things, love God, love people. The law is love. Last week, Kurt, talking about the Pharisees, were asking, is it lawful to divorce? Is there a way, and basically what he was saying is that, is there a way that I can do something that I want to do and technically still follow the rules? Oh, us humans love loopholes, don't we? I can follow the rules, I can be good, everyone's going to think, and I can skirt around what I really don't want to do and still look good, still sound good. We want to ask, where is the line? How close can I get? How much can I get away with and still go to heaven? Jesus is reiterating here that it is love that compels us to live, not the law. The law doesn't compel us. It's love that compels us to live. You can't follow the law without love. And you should never try to love without the law. We sometimes have a hard time equating the two. Do I do the legal thing or do I do the loving thing? Well, Jesus says they're the same thing. Love God, love people. Love has a much higher standard than the technicality of the law. Matthew in his Sermon on the Mount, as, as Jesus was preaching, and maybe this was a first full-on sermon that he preached, maybe it was a... a, a an edited, come down, Matthew's writing, kind of taking a lot of his teaching over the years, throwing it into one teaching time to kind of kick off the story of who Jesus is and his public ministry. But in that sermon, it says a number of times, Jesus says, you have heard it said, and then he quotes the law. And then he says, but I tell you, and then he quotes love. In all of these situations, go back and read that Sermon on the Mount again with that in mind, that Jesus quotes the law, and then he says, that's where the line is, that's where the technicality is, but let me draw a different line for you, and I'm calling that line love. Jesus said in there, he said that always there was a higher standard. You have heard it said do not murder. That's the law, right? Do not murder. I say, don't hate. Don't call your brother an idiot. Well, Jesus, I haven't murdered. No. Back way up here, remember last week when you called your brother an idiot? Yeah, that, that's the love line. You broke that. You weren't even close to the murder line, but you broke the love line. Do not commit adultery. Never, never, I'm close, never. Remember last week, look at a woman lustfully, that's the love line. It's a different line, it's a different standard. Jesus said, yeah, the law is this, but love is a higher standard than the law. Had an argument with an elder, not here. I've never yet eldered, argued with an elder here, but I argued with an elder in the church over giving. I said that the tithe was a great place to start, 10%. How much do I give? What, what, what do I, how do I determine that? 10% tithe. That's Old Testament. It teaches a tithe. And he said, yeah, but that's the law. 10%. That's the law. We're not living under the law anymore. We're living under grace. Yeah, you know what love says? Be a cheerful, generous giver and give more. In fact, the Old Testament was actually about 23% is what they gave. We only want to focus on 10 of that. 
But Jesus draws the line much farther back from the technical law and the law of love. Jesus said that it's not a matter of which is the greatest. He says anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. The law draws the line in one place, but Jesus draws the line way back. Nowhere near the technicality of the law, but where love resides. Love is the standard for living out the law, and the law is the filter to determine what is loving, because we don't get to decide what is loving. God draws the line here for the law. He draws the line. Jesus drew the line back here for loving. And then Jesus gets to define what loving is. We don't. We don't get to define what is the loving thing to do. And when you live your life that way, by God's standard of love and law, and Jesus' definition of what love is, then you're on your way. See, this guy wasn't quite there. You are almost, he says at the end. You are not far. You're you're getting it. So what does Jesus say? Love God, love people. What does it mean to love God? That's where we're at this morning. Love God, love people. He says three things, or four things. He says, "Love love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So what does it mean to love God with all your heart? We're going to bounce through each, all four of these. And then we'll look at love people and what that means. To love God with all your heart is an understanding of the word worship. With our heart is worshiping the person of God. It's not just the idea of a God. But we understand that the God of Scripture, the Yahweh, Elohim, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who came in the person of Jesus and resides as the Holy Spirit in the world today, that is who we worship. And it has to be from the heart, not from the head. There's a heart element, a worship element. Love God with your heart. And I'm not referring to 75 minutes on a Sunday morning a few times a month. Those are opportunities to display what's going on in your heart. Opportunities to gather with others who share that heart and join with them. You see, the heart is often understood to be the the seat of emotion, the seat of desires, the seat of passions. This is where love takes root. And we love God from that place, from that deep place. That all of our emotions are wrapped in God. All of our desires are wrapped in God. All of our passion is wrapped in God. You can't fake what is in the heart. Eventually, it will come out. You can hide it for a while. You can fake it for a while. But if it's not true, if it's not truly what is in your heart, it will eventually reveal itself as fake. Love God with your heart. It's not about the outside appearance. It's not about the, the, how we look, what we do. It's, it's what's going on inside. Mark chapter 7. Jesus said just a few chapters before this, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, they had the outside thing going on. They honored with the lips. They came in, they sang all the songs, they said all the prayers, they went amen at the right time. They said, yes, we want to hear the truth. When the pastor asked, do you want to hear the truth? They all, yes. They honored me with their lips, but when they walked out the door, I was far from their hearts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Acknowledge God's presence moment by moment throughout your day. See where He is at. See where He is working. When you're going to school, God is with you. When you're going to to, to work, God is with you. When you're going to go play, God is with you. When you're going home, God is with you. Not just here on a Sunday morning. This is icing on the cake. 
What we get to experience here in worship when we come together and join voices and join hearts. But love your God with all your heart happens out there. On a moment by moment, daily basis. Where is your heart? On Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. Where is your heart Thursday night at 10 o'clock? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. Soul is what separates us from the rest of creation. Human, Adam, Eve, the only two that were given a soul. The rest were given life. But Genesis tells us that in the creation of Adam, God breathed into him the breath of life. And that was the soul. That we, we were each given that and we're to love God with our soul. The soul is what determines conduct, determines decisions. The soul is, a, is power for life. When something resides in your soul, it is immovable. The soul is what, li- what the heart sits on, okay? We think heart and soul, yeah, we got the heart, and the heart is deep-rooted, the emotions, the desires, the passions. The soul is where the heart gets its life, is where the heart gets its energy, is where the heart gets its foundation. The soul is deeper even than the heart, It is the soul that enables you to endure hardship. It's the soul loving God, rooted in God, recreated by God. When we're a new creation, when we accept Christ, old things are gone, new has come, God recreates that soul. Begins to conform that back to the image of himself as he created. When we love God with our soul, it's the, the, the commitment is deep and hard to move. When something is embedded in your soul, you're not changing your mind on that. We don't fall away when God has, when we love God the Lord our God, with all our soul. And how do we love with our soul? One word, confession. Confession is what sets us right. See, because our soul, when Adam and Eve sinned and they fell, their nature, their soul, their very being became sinful beings. Fallen human nature is what we will refer, how we refer to it sometimes. That you in your humanness are fallen, sinful. And when we accept Christ, when we understand our need for a Savior and we give our life to Him and we thank Him for His death on the cross that that pays for us, that pays the penalty of that sin, and He begins to restore us back to the image of God, conform to the image of Jesus, Romans says, That when that process starts, we still have, oh, that it weren't so, but we still have that human nature, that sin. There's a tug of war. There's a civil war going on inside our soul. Who's going to win? Confession. When we sin, and we do from time to time, we're not sinless. I always say we're not sinless, but I hope we sin Less and less and less as we're conformed into the image of God, as we we give more and more of our life over to Him. And confession is the thing that kind of reboots the system, rewrites, okay? That when we sin, John says, if if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a moment by moment thing. That's not a past thing. That's a right now and a future. We know that if I sin and I confess it, Okay, that confession is what gets our soul back right, restores us. 
And confession simply means to agree with God. That's what the word means. That I agree with God. Yep, that's wrong. I did it. I'm confessing it to God. I did that. And we can then, he forgives us. When our desires differentiate from God's, confession is the thing that we go to. And this needs to be a daily. We say worship all your heart, worship wherever you go, all your soul. A daily confession, a daily coming to God. A daily reconnect, a daily reboot, if you will, cleansing of that soul. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, worship, with all your soul, confession, and with all your mind. This is our thinking self. This is how we reason things out. This directs our opinions, our thoughts, our beliefs, how we determine right and wrong comes from how our mind reasons things. Love for God requires more than an emotional response. Okay? Love and law. That, that's two. Word and truth. We, we need a, a truth aspect to this. And our mind is what gives us that, that determining of right and wrong, that, that we need what we call worldview. We need apologetics. We need to understand. We need to be able to reason through Scripture. How we think, knowing why we believe, able to answer the questions, who is God? Who is Jesus? What is the kingdom of heaven? How can I be saved? Where's the line? We need to be able to answer all those, and those things come from reasoning out Scripture, from understanding truth, from wrapping our minds around the Word of God, the purposes of God. It's a balance of heart and mind, of emotion and truth. And how do we love with all our mind? It's the word repentance. Because repentance means a change of mind. It means that I've come in contact with a way of thinking that doesn't seem to align up with Scripture. I've come up with an action that I've been doing that doesn't line up with the truth of who God is, and I have to, one, confess that. That's my soul. I, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm, I, I understand the pain and the emotion of, of, of transgressing against God, doing something wrong. And now I have to, in my mind, rethink what I thought, what I did, and I need to repent. That's a turning around. That's a doing it the different way, doing it God's way. This is the way I was heading. I see this is not right thinking. This is not right acting. I need to repent, and I need to go back the other way. That's loving God with our mind. That's thinking through and understanding what is right, what is wrong. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 Paul says, so Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Christ who is the head. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Did you catch all of that? That, that? that whole confession, repentance, how it's all working together? That we, if, if we are not, if we don't reach a unity of faith, a unity of knowledge, if our mind is not loving God with our mind, then we're going to be tossed back and forth by every kind of teaching that comes our way. Because we not in our heart, in our soul, in our mind, grabbed hold of God's truth. Careful how you think. 
Francis Chan, anytime I find myself disagreeing with something in the Bible, I have to assume I am wrong. I can't try to find the loophole, can't try to move the line. I just have to confess and repent and love the Lord my God with my soul and my mind and change, be transformed. With all your heart, worship, with all your soul, confession, with all your mind, repentance, and with all your strength, service. This is our physical capacity. This is how we live our life for others to see in all of our strength. And and the word, too, is holiness. This is my whole life. This is my time, my talents, my treasures, serving, giving, doing. This is putting action behind everything the heart and the mind and the soul believe. I'm now putting it into action. I'm now living it out. And holiness needs to be the outcome. Jesus talked a lot about a couple things. One is finances. He said, in all your strength, finances need to line up. Because where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Where your heart is, the seat of your emotions, your desires, and your passion, your money's following that. Jesus knew the importance of lining all that up. And we can see where our heart is by looking at where our money goes. That's the physical, that's the strength, that's the outpouring, that's the visible. I had a professor in college that said, I can look at two things and tell where you are at spiritually mature or not. I can look at your checkbook and I can look at your calendar. Where your money goes and where you're going, how you're spending your time. Finances were a big thing. It says this is, this is the reason for receiving an offering every week. Kurt said it last week, I don't know if he got any grief from it, that Eagle doesn't need your money. We don't. We're not dependent upon you writing checks or giving through text or online or having your bank give us a draw. We are not dependent on that. We're dependent on God. As a church, we are dependent upon God. And, and the, the whole financial end is not something that we, it's something you just need to do as part of being a believer. That goes back to the tithe, that the finances are not something we need to ask for. It's a discipline that we just need to begin practicing with all your strength. Tithing is an act of love toward God, not toward eagle, not toward the staff. It isn't about eagle. All your strength is about your relationship with God. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. I would be right in saying that God loves a worshiping giver. That that just becomes a part of my worship. My outward expression of who God is. With all your strength. Your time. There were those that Jesus called and, and they said, yes, we want to follow you, but first, let me go say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, go, never mind. He called someone else and he said, yeah, but first, let me go bury my father. That seems like a pretty big deal, right? My dad just died. I need to go bury him. As soon as the funeral's over, I'll catch up with you. Jesus said, no, let the dead bury the dead come follow me. What he meant by that, so it doesn't sound really harsh, is there is a good chance that the guy's dad was not dead yet. That would have been the understanding. Let me bury my father. Let me wait until my father dies. So let me devote myself to my family, and then when that's all taken care of, I'll come find you. And Jesus goes, no. I'm looking for an all-in. I'm looking for a surrender. I'm looking for a submission, a full-on, all your strength. 
This is James' teaching on faith and works coming together. James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The deception is in the hearing a good sermon but not allowing the truth to transform you. I don't know how many times, and it will probably stop now after I say this, then when I'm done preaching, inevitably someone will come up and say, Pastor, that was a good sermon. You know what my response is? Whether it's actually said or just thought. Well, we'll see. If you live it out, if you take the truth, gnaw on it, chew on it, allow it to transform you through confession and repentance, and you change the way you live, yep, it was a good sermon. If you hear the words and so deceive yourselves and walk out with absolutely no difference in the way you live your life, I might as well have been reading Dr. Seuss. Doers of the word. Love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your physical capabilities. Loving God is putting Him first in every area of your life. It's always seeking to align your life with His life. And you can't do that on your own, in your own power. And God knows that. Jesus understands that. This standard is unattainable. This is not attainable to walk right up to the line. How much can I get? This one's really not attainable to to draw the love line way back here. Without Christ in my life, I can't do that. Without Christ in my life, I'm probably going to step across this line and break the law. Because by nature, fallen sinful nature, that's who I am. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. We can't love God in isolation from other people. It's the whole, I love God, I don't love the church. I like that guy, I hate his bride. How loving is that? Yeah, the bride's not perfect. Church isn't perfect because we're not perfect. But if we're going to love God, we have to love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. We can never ask then, who is my neighbor? Jesus already answered that. He included everyone. Even those that we might identify as enemies. Love them. How do we love them? Pray for them. It's hard to hate someone that you're bringing before the throne of God and asking God to work in their life. Pray for them. There are no non-neighbors in your life. Everyone you come in contact with is a neighbor. If you love God, you will love people. And without God, it is impossible to truly love people because God defines what love is. We don't. The Apostle John, in that first epistle, says that God is love, that he personifies love. Everything he does is from a foundation of love. Love is an all-encompassing attribute of God. And it permeates everything He does. Therefore, it should permeate everything we do if Jesus is truly living His life through us. That's how we love people. He does not act except that He acts out of love. I'm not going to get into the whole justice and judgment and how is that loving. It is. Okay, that's probably for another time because in the next five minutes, I'm not doing that. But that is to describe our life as well. As we surrender our life and allow the Holy Spirit to live through us, the Holy Spirit desires to love through us. And every person we come in contact with, the Holy Spirit wants to love. 1 John 4, we love because He first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. What he's saying is, if you say you love God and you hate that person over there, you don't love God. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also, must also love their brother and sister. Who's my brother and sister? Everyone I come in contact with. That's the golden rule. Matthew chapter 7, in, every, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So the question is not, who should I love, but how do I love? If I'm to love all, everybody that I come in contact with, how do I do that? Well, it starts with, love them with your heart. It's the exact same four words, heart, soul, mind, strength. Love them with your heart. That, that word is neighborly, friendship. Be kind to everyone you meet. What is your relationship right now with your neighbors? What is your relationship with your coworkers, with the parents of your kids' friends? God has you in the neighborhood you live in or in the area you live in next to the people that you live next to Because he wants to love them. And you're his mode of doing that. You're how he's going to get that job done. If you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, your neighbor's going to know what love is. Because you're loving on them. This is intentionality with our neighbors. It's building relationships. It's caring for our neighbors. For those that we come in contact with. Love people with all your soul. The word's compassion. Compassion means a gut level love. This is the deep down. This is like the soul. We talk about the soul as that foundation that the heart is built on. Compassion is that deep down gut level love. It's not a passing gesture. This is a sacrificial love. This is the Good Samaritan story. When he saw the man beaten along the side of the road, he took pity on him, it says. He had compassion on him. He stopped what he was doing, busted up his schedule. He probably had a meeting he needed to get to, but there was a person lying on the road that needed him, and he said, first priority, right here. The meeting, going to have to understand. And if they don't, so be it. God does. And he stopped. And he bandaged up his wounds and he took care of him and he loaded him onto his, I don't know, into the back seat of his car and drove him to a place where he would be taken care of and he put money down to make sure that the man was taken care of. That was not in his daily schedule. But he had compassion, a deep level sense of hurt for that man. And he cared for him. Go the extra mile. Allowing ourselves to be inconvenienced to help those around us. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We need to love people with our mind. This is the word truth. This is not a sappy kind of love. This is not purely an emotional aspect of love. The word says, if you love me, you will agree with me. That's what the world says, right? If you love me, you'll agree with everything I say. If you, and that's the problem we have right now, if you disagree with anyone, suddenly you're a hateful person because you pointed out that they were wrong, that there is a standard of truth and you just violated it and now you're a hater. We need to love people with our minds. Many times the most loving thing that you can do is disagree with them because they're wrong. And they're headed down a dangerous path. And the outcome of the path that they are on, the belief that they hold, the truth that they say is truth, the actions that they are doing is destruction. And you need to speak truth. You need to try to redirect them. When you see that someone is in active rebellion or disobedience to God, confronting the sin and leading them to a place of repentance is the most loving thing you can do. You might lose a friendship over it. Take the risk. Galatians chapter 6, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual and should restore him gently. But watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. This goes back to the compassion. 
carrying the burden, carrying their burden for where they are, for the decisions they're making. Come alongside them. Share that truth in love. And then strength. Physically. Back to serving people. No, to, no greater love than this, that a man lays down his life for his friend, for another human being. Sacrifice in service. If we want to love people, we're going to sacrifice for them. Again, same with God. We're going to sacrifice our time. We're going to sacrifice our talents. We're going to sacrifice financially to help other people, to love on other people. James chapter 2, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. This goes back to where we put faith and, and action together. It's not enough to give lip service, not enough to say, it's not enough to agree that yes, the doctrinal statement, the statement of faith is right and I believe that, but I go out and live like the world. Nope, you don't. Faith, love, faith and deeds together. And that's service. That's how we serve people. It, it may mean persevering with a person. It may mean hanging with a person through some of the darkest days. It may mean giving up some time to serve, to meet them. Love is an action. When we had the prayer set on Tuesday mornings, uh, up in the, in the prayer room, 10 o'clock Tuesday mornings, we gather for one of our prayer sets and We've been praying over what we've, what we've done is the scripture that we pray through is whatever the teaching text is that following Sunday. And I have found this when I preach invaluable. Because I go into that prayer set and I'll read the scripture and people start praying through that scripture. Dude, I'm taking out my phone and I am notes because God is speaking through them in the prayers while they're praying through that scripture that I'm about to preach on in a few days. And God is like, hey, listen to that. You need to li li listen to that. God begins speaking through all of them. I don't know if people in there think I'm texting my wife during prayer set, but I am listening to God, and I am writing it down because I don't want to forget it. This last week was no different. Someone prayed, love gets on planes and goes to Ecuador. Love gets on planes and goes to Sicily. Love gets on planes and goes to Berlin. Love gets on planes and goes to Bosnia. That's what love does. There's a sacrifice involved. There's a risk involved. Love sacrifices time, and love shows up three nights a week to VBS. Not your normal schedule. You're going to have to rearrange things. You're going to be tired at the end of the day. You're not sure how you're going to do it, but you know what? By God, I'm going to do it. That's service. That's sacrifice. We show up. Love shows up at VBS. Love prays for others. Love takes risks. It's action. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. I don't know whether the, that leader was trying to trap Jesus or not, but he agreed with Jesus. Pretty big of him. Tell Jesus he thought he was right. And then kind of says his own things with, with Scripture. At least intellectually, he said, because Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now that may have stung when Jesus said that. That may have stung a little bit like it did with the rich young ruler when Jesus said, yeah, you're right, now go sell everything and come follow me. We talked about last week. When he said, you're not far, you're close. I think the guy thought he was all in. He thought he was living right. Jesus said, yep, and I agree with all that, I'm good. Jesus said, you're not quite there. And that may have stung. Because the teacher's understanding was external. It was intellectual. He was a teacher of the law. He could quote it all. But it was not heart-changing or life-changing. Because did you get his answer? When he said, teacher, you are right. He said, 
You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding or all your mind, and with all your strength. What did He leave out? With all your soul. He kept it external. He kept it fluffy on the outside. He kept it emotional, kept it intellectual, kept it physical. But don't get me spiritual. Don't change who I am at the very center of who I am. Let me live my life the way I want. Jesus says, you are so close. But no, you're not there yet. Jesus was saying it isn't enough just to agree, to make an intellectual admission of facts. It's got to transform your life. And that comes through surrender and submission to Jesus. To the person and the authority of the Son of God. We've said that a lot while in the gospel because that is the message of the gospel. That Jesus is enough. I am not. I need him. You need him. As we sing these next couple songs, I want you to really think through, what is Jesus speaking? Is it my heart? Is it my mind? Is it my soul? Is it my strength? Lord, where am I lacking? Show me that I might confess, that I might repent, that I might leave these walls and love you as I love others. Amen? Father, this morning, speak to us. Through your Holy Spirit, teach us how to love. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you uh, stand up with us here? The greatest love that anyone could ever know overcame the cross and grave to find my soul until I see you face to face grace amazing takes me home I'll trust in you with all I am I live to see your kingdom come did my heart
Thanks for being there when we're not. And we just love you. Pray that this kind of just takes us into our week now. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ryan. A couple real quick announcements. Uh, My Gross Aid, we are doing the school supply drive. The information is out. Pick one of these up on your way out on the table. Uh, The table's right next to the offering boxes, so you can drop your offering in there as you go out, or you can text, or you can give online, and we all know why. I already told you why. Um, Now I'm telling you how. Um, And uh, so pick one of these up. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to be gathering these. Um, And and, uh, here's the thing with that. I should have had to save this one for last. Two other announcements. Save the dates. Uh, Women, July 17th, we have a worship night for you down in the courtyard downstairs. Um, through there, Chanel uh, is going to be leading worship, a uh, phenomenal worship leader uh, that we just discovered in our midst, and she's going to come and lead, and it's going to be a great night for you. Men, July 20th, that Saturday night, um, we're going to gather at uh, David Sweeney's and uh, just have a time of fellowship and community. So uh, you can go to eaglechurch.com backslash events, go to the calendar, you can find all of the things that are happening. So my gross aid, here's why we do this. Every time you go shopping and you pick up extra school supplies and you bring them in, you fulfill the greatest commandment. Love God, love people. Every time you go and you help your neighbor and you, you, you ask them how they're doing and you pray for them, it's, you've, you've fulfilled the greatest commandment. Love God, love people. That every time we go out and we be Jesus to people, we fulfill the greatest commandment. So I leave you with this as the benediction. Probably not a normal benediction, but here we go. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely I will be with you always to the very ends of the age. The great commission, the great commandment, hand in hand. Go, be doers of the word, and we'll see you back next week.